everyone hear me okay in the back row if I don't use the microphone? Everyone hear me okay? Can you hear me? Good? Louder? Okay. Good? Okay. So welcome to my talk, which I'm calling Adventures in Conversational UIs. Uh, for, let me introduce myself. I'm, uh, whoops, there we go. My name is Phil Gambling. I'm a technical lead at Expiro. Uh, and what does that mean? Well, I'm a, I love building front ends. I'm a JavaScript nerd. I love re using React. Uh, as a tech lead, I'm mostly reviewing my team's pull requests. Um, and Yvonne is one of, my, uh, one of my colleagues, and he puts up with a lot of my criticisms, but no, he's wonderful. Uh, and when I'm not doing that, I'm, I'm pondering the next phases of the, cin uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Uh, as you can tell, I'm not from around here. Uh, I'm from Houston, Texas. And the, uh, this week, I hopped in my TARDIS on Tuesday and materialized here uh, on Wednesday. Uh, and I've been, just enjoyed the week. The people here have been great. The weather has been great. It, even though all the natives tell me that the weather has been terrible this week, it's been wonderful. So where do I come from? I come from Houston, Texas. Uh, a little bit about my hometown. It's officially called uh, Space City because we're home to Johnson Space Center, which is the home to NASA and Mission Control. Um, everything, what we like to say in Texas is everything is bigger in Texas. And we're, we're the fourth largest city by population. And we used to be the fattest city in the United States. <laughs> Thankfully, we don't hold that honor anymore, not by a long shot. Um, the metro area of Houston is so large that the entire island of Tenerife could fit within it, just to give you some perspective. Um, except we can drive across Houston. We don't have a giant volcano in the middle. Um, so you're not here to hear about Houston and Texas. And you're probably wondering, why is this self-proclaimed uh, front end guy here to talk about conversational UIs? Uh, well, back in June, when I was, I was motivated to come up with a talk for, the, um, for this uh, conference, I was thinking about topics that I wanted to learn more about, and a talk, giving a talk is a great way to kind of motivate yourself to learn more. And conversational UIs, chatbots, these are things that I work with uh, or use on a daily basis. So think of Google Home, Siri, Slack bots. I mean, I'm interacting with these all the time. So I, was, I wanted to get a better perspective on what it takes to build one. Um, so what are they? As I mentioned, voice assistants, that's one you're probably very familiar with. We've got Siri, uh, Google Home, Alexa, uh, Windows has Cortana. Um, these are general purpose voice-based assistants. Chatbots, so uh, if you use any messaging platform, there's prob probably a way to provide chatbots. Uh, like we use Slackbot for all kinds of things uh, at our company's internal Slack. And I'm frequently finding them popping up on websites to fill a kind of a customer service role. Um, this screenshot is taken from an auto dealership when I was scheduling a service appointment and a little bot popped up. It's not really a person named Paul, this is a persona on top of the bot to just basically ask me like if it could help out. So I was like, well, let's try it. And yeah, they booked my appointment through the bot. It was pretty quick and easy. Um, call centers now, when you call in for customer service uh, with a company, are frequently manned by a, by a bot. You know, we used to get menus of numbers to press to get to, the, get to our, uh, our request. Now usually you, you're uh, told to speak, like, how can I help you today? And then it interprets what your intent is. What do you want to do? And this is another example I, I see on a weekly basis. So in Houston, Curbside delivery of your groceries at the supermarket is increasingly common. Uh, and what that is, is we'll, my wife and I will you know, we'll put in our grocery order for the week. They give you a window to go pick it up. You drive to the store. And when you park, there's just a sign with a number to text and a unique ID. And, and that's just a basic example of a conversational UI. It just by that, by the phone number, by the ID, they know what parking spot you're in, who you are, what the order is, and they'll bring it out to your car. And a human has to do the, the grocery loading. We're not there yet, completely automated solution. But what I like about it is it's a very elegant solution. I don't need to install a one-off app for this. I just have to have texting on a phone, and every phone supports this. So it's a very quick interaction. So use cases for conversational UIs, things like frequently asked questions, knowledge search, uh, customer service, at least kind of the initial triaging the request and figuring out how to, where you need to go. Anything that's a routine task from maybe ordering food or booking a trip. 
Um, voice assistants, as we all know, are great for anything where you need to be hands-free, away from a keyboard. Um, and they add a new uh, avenue to add accessibility to your product. So think of uh, how for a blind person, a voice assistant is still very easy to use and interact with to get information. Um, and little kids, my, I have three little kids and they've mastered using our Google Home to play, play music, play funny animal sounds, uh, turn on the TV and do everything mom and dad don't want them to do. Uh, and my oldest can just barely write now and she certainly can't type. Uh, but she can get Google Home to do things. So how do you, that's kind of the motivation for what is a conversational UI, what is a chat bot, um, how would you go about building one? Um, you know, do I need to become a master of deep machine learning uh, to process natural language? No, like most things today, uh, natural language processing is a service that you can get from any cloud provider. Um, and in the middle, these are kind of the, uh, some of the more common ones. We have Amazon Lex. This is, this is essentially the engine that powers Alexa. Um, IBM has Watson, Google has Dialogflow, and um, Microsoft has Azure Bot Framework. And so at a high level, uh, a chatbot architecture kind of looks like this. You have channels, so this is messaging clients. This could be Telegram, Twitter. Facebook Messenger, Slack, it could be a text message, or it could be speech to text through a call center. All of these kind of come in the same way as just as plain messages to a natural, natural language processor. And the thing that the natural language processor is doing is, is unlike uh, you know, when we're programming, calling a function, or making an API request, human requests are kind of fuzzy. We don't always ask for things the same way. We don't word things the same way every time, and we don't always give you enough information up front. So the processor is going to go back and forth and manage that conversation until it gets to a point where we have the intent. Like, what is this user trying to accomplish? So what is their intent? And then any information I need to fulfill that intent. So think, you know, arguments to a function call. Once I've extracted all of that, then I can pass it off to another service so to fulfill that request. So the, the natural language processor is kind of sitting here in the middle managing that, that human to computer interaction via tech, via conversation. Um, so for most of this talk, I, I focused on using Amazon Lex. Um, it's not an endorsement for Lex over any other um, uh, choice. It, I mainly wanted to stay within the AWS ecosystem. So um, if, you, if you want to work with an AWS uh, and build a chat bot, Lex is obviously a good choice. Um, and so at a lower level architecture, it would look something like this. Um, some, there's some integration for things like Slack and Facebook Messenger and text messaging out of the box. That means I create a Lexbot, put in some configuration, and I'm connected. But any other third party service like Telegram or Twitter can be connected pretty simply through webhooks or other uh, HTTP request methods where just some, some integration code to connect them to Lex will allow you to connect to multi-channel, so you don't have to be locked into just what Lex supports out of the box. Uh, Lex sits in the middle, does all the, all the processing of the conversation, and then it's, it's more lambdas fulfilling your request. So it may break out to uh, making requests to a database, to third-party services, whatever it is you're trying to do. At that point, it's like any other uh, service. So getting even, looking even further down, I've talked about this term intent, and there's some vocabulary to go through. Um, intents are, are basically the main thing that you're gonna model when you're working with Lex. Like what is the user attempting to, uh, what is their goal, what are they trying to do? Um, an utterance is everything the user says. So if I'm invoking an intent, whatever the utterance was, whatever they typed or spoke is what triggered that intent. Um, slots are basically uh, the pieces of data needed to fulfill the intent. So they're, they're function arguments. Prompts are things your bot will say to elicit more information. So if your user didn't provide enough information up front, you'll be prompted. And then fulfillment is the term for once I have everything I need, now let's fulfill this request. All right, so we're, for the rest of this talk, we're mostly, now we're actually gonna build a bot. Uh, and because uh, there isn't enough advanced technology in the world to, to combine snarky text and funny images, we're going to build a meme bot. Um, and we're going to do that with Telegram, 
uh, we're going to do that with lambda functions, and of course, Lex is going to sit in the middle. And thankfully, I don't need to go deep into Le into serverless because Ron just gave us a fantastic talk on it. Um, so I'm going to kind of gloss over Telegram and serverless and using lambdas, and we're mostly going to focus on configuring Lex and using logic from lambdas to kind of uh, add a more advanced and override some of the default behavior of a Lex bot. And then to generate the images, I'll use this service imageflip.com just because it was very easy to connect. And you can try it out for yourself. So if you have Telegram installed, um, and if you have Wi-Fi access, <laughs> like look for JS Day meme bot. Uh, it's the one with Ralph Wiggum. And uh, you can play along with it. That's kind of going to be, that's like my reference production version. And the code is on GitHub right here. So if, uh, if you can't see anything or you want to reference it later, feel free. That'll be available after the talk. Uh, and now if you don't mind, I'm kind of tall, so I'm going to have to sit here. And uh, we're going to actually dive into it. So um, this is what we're going to build. So this is a Telegram bot. And uh, it's already learned some of the canary in culture. Um, but basically, it's a, very, it's a very simple conversation. So it starts with something like, I, I want a meme. And then what kind of meme do you want to use? So this is kind of the name of, the, of a meme. Or it, it'll do like a little fuzzy search on available memes. So let's do something that might be Batman related. The next question is where do I want to place the text? So I've got a couple slots where I can fit text in. I can fit it in the, the top, the bottom. I might just want it in one place. So there's a, there's a fork here that we need to uh, get from the user. So I'm going to say top and bottom. Uh, and then let's say on top right, hello, bottom, JS day. And then it'll go off and work. And there we go. We've generated a meme. So <laughs> that's it. That's the extent of what we're building today. But let's actually look at how we get there. Um, so I'm in the AWS console. Let's see that. Yeah, everyone can see that. Um, and I've done a few steps ahead of time just uh, for the sake of time. Um, but when you create a, a bot, you have a few settings. So out of the box, um, it supports Facebook, Slack, uh, SMS, and a messaging service called Kick that I've never used. But these are ones that, with you know, with whatever configuration you need for Facebook, for example, you'd enter this information. And now you're wired up directly. So you have a whole layer of code you don't have to write. Uh, but in my case for Telegram, I've created a, a simple webhook to take Telegram events and pass them into Lex. Um, and then uh, there's some other settings that we'll get into a little bit later. There's this concept of a session. So you can track information across intents that you might need to come back to. And basically, you can set a session timeout. So this is just sort of cross intent state that you may, may need to hold on to. Um, and then there are monitoring tools to help further refine and debug your conversations down the road. But most of, most of your time is spent in this intent editor. And uh, looking at the other providers, they're all kind of similar. So a lot of these concepts carry over to like a, a dollar float. Go ahead. Oh, sure. Oops. How's that? Thanks. Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, so at this point, I have a very simple um, intent. I've, I've just provided an utterance. Um, and what these sample utterances are, are basically training data for the natural language processor to, to parse your request. But it's not an exhaustive list of everything I have to say to invoke my request. And uh, Lex provides a handy little feature here, this little test client. So I can sit and we, we're going to mostly play with the conversation here. Uh, rather than having to go back to Telegram and constantly pushing out code. So the idea is that you can make changes here, but you don't have to publish. You can have different stages of a development, a QA, and maybe a production version. So anything you do here doesn't immediately break your client. So let's see what it does if I ask for something. I, I, I want a meme. Seems like it should understand that. At this point, it won't do much other than tell us, well, I understood. It's ready for fulfillment. But what if I said, how's the weather? OK, I didn't understand. So it's kind of a dumb bot, but at least it doesn't just say yes to everything. So let's add a few more examples of how I might invoke this intent. Uh, I need to create a meme. want to make a meme. Uh, create a new meme. Every time you make a change, uh, you have to build this. This is to update the underlying model. 
And sometimes it's a little fat, like sometimes it's fast, sometimes it's slow. Um, but once this builds, our our little test client over here will be able to will be able to try it out. And so while that's building, some of the other settings we're going to add on to here are well, adding slots. We'll add the data I need to fulfill the request. And there's also a couple points where we can hook in lambdas to fulfill the request, and also lambdas to do uh, like inter conversation uh, validation. So okay, so it's built. So now the bot is ready to be to test. So uh, let's try something that's not in this list. I want to create a I meme. So it understood that, but you'll notice I didn't actually write that phrase in here. Um, and again, if I do something like "How's the weather," it still doesn't just respond to that. So, so it's it's interpreting what I'm am, I'm putting in here, but it's still smart enough not to just like match on everything. But this isn't very useful yet. Um, ideally, we would want to add some information about what kind of meme do I want to create, where do I want to put the text, what is the text. So to do that, that's where we're going to use slots. So I'm going to fill in the slots down here. And this is very much think um, function arguments and types. So for the meme name, and let me enter these and kick off the build. And then I'll explain what, what all this did. So what meme do you want to use? Uh, we need uh, text placement. Where, where do you want to put the text? Top text, so that'll be what we want to put on top. And then bottom text. So this will be all four slots, all four pieces of information our bot needs right on the bottom. All right, and I'm going to make all of these required right now and then kick off the build. So, so the slots have obviously a name. Uh, they have a type. So if these can be, Amazon provides a, a huge list of built-in types. But you can provide your own type. So they can range from things like uh, just simply limiting the match. Like there's a type for European cities, and that just helps the model further refine its matching. But it has uh, types like date that will take things like tomorrow, today, January 20th, and it will convert. It'll always convert them to an ISO format. So your code always gets some, a standard response. Um, and then there's thing when I added my own, uh, you'll notice for the meme name, I chose book. That seemed kind of like an unusual choice. So I just sort of found that book titles and meme titles seem to match pretty well. So that was a safe choice. Whereas the meme text placement, I really just have three values I can accept. I need um, top, bottom, or both. And so you'll see that I have a custom slot type over here that in this case is essentially just an enumeration. These are three values I can accept. But I can also provide some synonyms because the user may not answer exactly the same way, but these are probably the common ways they're going to answer it. So you can you can create a custom type of uh, what they have as a restricted slot value, or I could choose this expanded value, and that's similar to the sample utterances up here. This is the kind of things people might say, um, but it's not an exhaustive list, but it just better refines the match. Um, and then lastly, this free text one, which is a little unusual. Lex doesn't have a built-in type for just literal string, like whatever the user says, take it. Um, but an interesting hack for this is someone actually created a type that is a bunch of sentences extracted from a Sherlock Holmes novel, and like, like you know, hundreds of sentences. This was uploaded with a file, and it gives it a very loose match, so it's, it works pretty well. And there's another, there's another um, way to handle this that I, I've got in GitHub that we probably won't get into today. So there are some quirks um, with Lex that some of the other providers might handle better. It's constantly updating. Um, but anyway, so when, now that I've entered these slots and it's finished building, what's going to happen? So let's see. So let's start with, I want to mean. OK, so now instead of saying it's ready for fulfillment, it's asking me for the first piece of information it needs. So these prompts that I provide and the order that I provide them in are the order that the bot is going to ask for information. So what meme do I want to use? Uh, a Yoda meme. 
Now, where do I want to put the text? Uh, as you've seen, I had three um, places I could, I have three ways I can answer this. I'm going to go with both. And if you'll notice down here, it's filling in the slots as I go. Um, there's a summary view. There's also a detail view, which is, this is the JSON that our Lambda function, which we'll get to next, we'll, we'll be receiving as we go. And uh, let's see, what do I want to write on top? Hello, what do I want to write on bottom? Cameraman, because someone's taking a picture of me right now. <laughs> so it still doesn't know what to do with this information, but it's at least echoed that it's ready for fulfillment and it got all the required information I asked for. Um, so let's actually wire it up to some fulfillment code that'll do something interesting. So um, as I mentioned, I've used serverless to deploy some Lambda functions because serverless is just lambdas. That's what I just learned. <laughs> but um, we're, we'll get into that in just a sec. So let's take man, demo generator. And like I said, every time you make a change in here, you need to build. Um, but one good thing is when we make changes to just lambda code and push that, I don't need to update anything here. This is really just wiring it up to um, a resource on AWS. So now what I'm expecting is to actually get an image back. Oh, it's still building. This is what I was talking about. The, it's a little unpredictable how long the build wants to take. It always slows down when you think it's going to be ready. Um, so what, what meme? Oops, what? Create a new meme. And what meme do you want to use? Let's. Uh, Let's use a Yoda meme. I'll use a Canarius meme. Uh, hello. All right. So now, oops, that did not work. Where do you want? To, oh, I didn't. So I'm getting ahead of myself. But notice I did not answer it the way um, I kind of got ahead and answered what text I wanted. So it does bail right now. If it it gives you a couple of attempts. So it asks for me what what text I want. Where do I want to put the text two times? And by default, it'll just quit after two tries. Um, that can be changed, and that can be overridden with Lambda code as well. So let's try that again. Create a meme. Canarius. Both. All right. So there we go. So instead of just um, giving us our data back now, it's actually made a call to image flip and got an image back. So let's actually look at that code. And how's the size on, on this? We're good? Zoom. Zoom in a little more? OK. Better? So, um, so I have a single Lambda. So as I mentioned, I'm using serverless. Not going too deep into that. But anyone who is familiar with the serverless framework, at this point, I have two functions, one for accepting requests from Telegram. And that's pretty, at this point, it's pretty much just a pass through, convert from Telegram's format to Lex format. And then the actual meme generator. So let's look at that. Um, the meme generate code handles two, there's two different places where Lex may call your lambdas. Um, if I go back here, there's fulfillment and there's also validation. Uh, right now, we've just, we're just doing fulfillment. So in this function, it's just extracting the slots as they come in. So this is the Lambda event. It has a current intent field, which has basically this is the current instant, uh, current state of the conversation. Um, and not, from the, this point, I need the meme name and the top and bottom text. So from that, I'll call out to image flip. I just have a, a light wrapper around image flip here to do a search based on the name. If it finds a valid meme that matches with whatever that input was, it'll Use that ID and the text I entered to make another call out to that service, uh, get a URL back, and then we'll, it'll send this back to the user with this, um, the response, uh, with this close event response. Um, and which, when you're adding these lambdas, you're essentially, you have a few things that you're, you're doing to Lex that it's not, uh, you're basically taking control of its normal behavior by responding with different actions that you want it to take. So in this case, I responded with close, which is just, I'm not expecting a response from the user, uh, but here's what I want you to tell them. And that, in this case, it was this URL. And just to further clarify those, so there's really, 
there's going to be five different actions that Lex can take depending on any utterance from the user. So first, I may just close the conversation, we're done, either I had an error or I fulfilled the request. Or I might want to just delegate. So uh, I don't have anything I want you, to, anything different I want you to do, just do what you would have always done. Um, and then the next three are basically I need more information. So maybe I need to elicit a specific slot and we'll, we'll use that in a sec. Or I might want to confirm the intent. So like, are you really sure you want to do what, um, what I think you want to do? Whoops. Uh, and then elicit intent is also another one if I want to maybe switch between uh, goals. I may, you know, do you, are you sure you want to do this? And it'll switch to a different kind of flow. But jumping back into that, so um, actually let me jump back into the Lexbot. So we've wired that up, but you'll now notice that um, one thing that I got, you know, up here I got into this error state where I didn't enter the text it was expecting. And so in any conversation, unlike uh, normal programs, where we can get into an error state, and we're kind of used to be like, well, I've hit a dead end, that's it. In human conversation, we don't just end the conversation. You always try to correct it and bring it back in. So to make a bot more uh, helpful and realistic, you would ideally want to keep the user on the happy path as best you can. So in this case, since I know the text placement question is a little, is a little weird, I can provide some uh, visual aids to the user. So we're going to add some quick responses, uh, since I, I really just want them to answer three different ways. So first, I'll provide a top answer. And these just, since I've used this text placement type, uh, it already knows what the possible values are. And top and bottom. All right, so let's build that. And so this is how. If we go back over to Telegram, this is how we generated um, uh, when, it, when it gave me a couple of three quick responses that we can also see here in the Lexbot test client. As soon as this little loading indicator of death finishes. There we go. So I want a new meme, and we'll use the Canarius one again because he's the funniest. So now I've got a visual aid. I could type these answers out. Um, it's probably more likely I'm just going to gravitate to clicking it. So it's not perfect. I could still answer in a way that the bot doesn't understand, but at least it increases the chances that we're going to stay on track. Um, so I've said top and bottom, hello world. Um, now, it's still a little, it's, there's more ways we can improve this conversation. One, it would be nice if I could provide some information up front, like what kind of meme am I trying to create? So let's, let's do that. The utterances themselves don't have to be static text. So maybe I want to just convey that information as part of the utterance. So this is where Lex allows you to basically include any of these slot types in your training data. Um, and that way we can kind of short circuit the conversation a little bit. So I want to meme, uh, make a new, all right, let's try that. So I want a Yoda meme. So right away, it's identified that meme name slot, and it's skipped ahead in our prompts to the next to the uh, text placement. This time I'm going to answer just top. So I'll we'll just say top text, but it's still asking me for the bottom. So that's kind of strange. That's not what I told it to do. So it looks like we need some conditional logic to control when what slots are asked for because now the top and the bottom text are contingent on what I answered to text placement. And we can do that by adding another lambda function. 
So we're going to wire up um, the same lambda. I've, I've actually contained both the validation logic and the fulfillment logic in the same lambda function just for uh, convenience. Um, and we're going to make a couple changes here. We're going to tell Lex that top text and bottom text are optional. But we'll, we'll allow our code to, take, to make those required. Um, so let me build that and let me jump back over to Visual Studio Code. So like I said, there's, this Lambda is handling two different uh, hooks, essentially. So there's a dialog code hook, and that signals I'm doing some validation. The user said something. I want you to run some logic on it. And if it doesn't match that, it means I'm ready for fulfillment. There's only, there's only two options. So scroll up here to my dialog code hook. And it's mostly just, um, just some conditional logic. So again, we wanna, we, at this point, we want to inspect the state of all the slots. Um, and right now, if I have meme name, if I don't have a meme name or text placement, I'm going to return this delegate action. I'm just going to tell Lex, just continue doing what you're doing. I don't have anything different to add here. So if we get further down, that means I have meme name, I have text placement. Uh, let's now elicit the slots for top text and bottom text. But let's only do that if the user asks for it. So in this case, I'm only going to ask for the top text if they answer it in a way of both or top, and similarly for bottom, I'll only ask if it's applicable. So this way, we're, we're not going to just ask for something that doesn't make any sense. Uh, and let's see if that's built. Let's try that now. So I'll say just bottom, and right there, now what do you want to write on the bottom? So it didn't bug me for text on top when I didn't need it. All right, so that's, that's great. <laughs> now, uh, let's see, where are we on here? So, oh yeah. So again, let's improve this conversation further. So one thing we haven't run into yet is it's possible for uh, the meme to not exist. And right now, I'm only handling that when I try to create something. So that means that we can go through a whole conversation. So I want a new meme. And let's just enter some random nonsense. Now it's still going, so okay, I guess that matched with something. Oh, okay, ran into an error. Well, it would have been nicer to have gotten, been told that earlier in the conversation, so again, so I could correct, it, bring the user back on course rather than just land at this dead end because that's frustrating. So we can do that. Um, let me use the magic of serverless framework and deploy some new code real quick. All right, while that's deploying, so all I've done uh, is update the, the validation logic. In this case, I added yet more conditional logic to uh, take a, bring, that, bring that meme search up from what was previously down here in fulfillment. I'm going to bring it up earlier. So as soon as the user has entered something, go and check if we have a meme name and if it's been validated. So if it hasn't been validated, let's do the search. Let's search for it now. If I don't find a match, well, let's, instead of just erroring out, let's give the user a chance to answer that question again, but we'll update the prompt with some useful information. So in this case, uh, I'm going to grab the top three current memes that Image Flip is suggesting, and I'm going to tell the user, I didn't find you know, whatever meme name you asked for, but here are the top three you might want to try. Tell me what meme you want to use. So, we're overriding the default behavior that we configured here. So in this case, I don't want to use this prompt, but I don't want to completely bail on this conversation. And so we're also going to use the elicit slot action again, um, because unlike close, I do expect a response. So let's try that again. I want a meme and give it random noise. There we go. This time we got we got an error earlier, but I'm not completely stuck. So, okay, yeah, I meant to do something like two buttons. There we go. So we're, we're back on track. And then, uh, there we go. Now oh, that JavaScript came out really tiny. Okay, so let's see, where are we on? Uh, so we've improved the conversation. 
Now, I mentioned earlier about uh, there's session attributes to so this setting um, here where why would you want to track a session across the conversation? Well, so one example might be like in a travel bot. It may allow, imagine a bot that allows you to book a flight and book a hotel. So the first intent may be booking that flight and I book it for November 9th to Tenerife. And then immediately I follow up with, now I want to book a hotel. Well, a, a well-crafted bot might do something smart like, well, I see that you just booked flights to Tenerife on November 9th. You also want to book a hotel for that date and location. Ah, yes, that's what I want. So we can accomplish that with uh, session attributes. Um, and let me again, using the magic of serverless, deploy some updates. All right, and we're going to do kind of a contrived example here. So I'm going to add another, a second intent. Um, and we're just going to add an intent that allows me to repeat what I just did. So I, I'm going to add an intent that allows me to ask the, uh, the meme bot, what did I just create? And just kind of show me if I created any recent memes and allow me to repeat that. And let's see, meme repeat. And I pre-created it just for interest of time. Oh, I need to wait on this deploy to finish. But when we look at that, it'll basically allow, it'll be a pretty simple intent uh, as far as the Lex configuration goes. We're just going to have it have a few phrases about like, oh, what did I just create? What do I um, make that again? But there will be no slot in for like validation because um, really it's going to pass off to this creation intent once this is finished. Actually, let me demo it over here. So I'll demo it in Telegram. So um, if I say something like create that again. No, well, maybe it doesn't know about it yet. Okay, here we go. So I haven't created anything in the, in, in the three minute session I've got configured. So let's go ahead and uh, I want a new meme. And if I say, oh, the Wi-Fi is killing me right now. There we go. <laughs> uh, what did I just make? There we go. So it just, it just parroted the meme I just created. And it'll now actually ask me if I want to make another one of those again. So uh, this is that um, confirm intent action that I was talking about. So, all right, yeah, here we go. Let's, let's finish deploying. Let's go ahead and add that. There we go. Okay, so like I was saying, it's a simple in intent with just a few utterances uh, in this case. Do that again, make that again, what meme did I just create? And there's only fulfillment code. There's no slots, there's no information to correct, collect, and there's no validation. So the interesting part um, is in, in, the in the function itself. So instead of actually inspecting the slots, now we're going to inspect the session attributes. So that's another field that will come in with a Lex event. And in this case, uh, after I create a meme, so if I go to the meme generator fulfillment code, anytime I create one successfully, I'm going to go ahead and store, store away uh, these session attributes. So let's, we'll store the meme type, the image, and the text. So it's available for this repeat handler to uh, inspect it. So first, if it finds some, if it doesn't find anything, I didn't find all the information I was expecting. Well, that's not necessarily an error. That is just like an, a, a valid outcome. So we're going to end the conversation with this close action and we're going to call it fulfilled and give them just a polite message. You haven't created any memes recently. There's nothing wrong with that. That was just a lookup. If you do have uh, a pre-existing meme, well, let's go ahead and we'll tell the user about it. And now we'll actually return this confirm intent action. So we'll actually see if they want to make a meme using that information. And this is, a, this is called intent switching. So I'm able to continue the conversation, but into another intent. So I haven't completely closed the, uh, the conversation yet because it looks like the user might still want to do something. And that, to go with like a travel example, that might be where you book an, uh, a flight. It may ask you immediately, well, do you want to book a hotel now? to kind of keep it going while the user's there and engaged. Um, and so to, to accomplish that, 
or we use this confirm, uh, elicit intent, or rather confirm intent. Um, and there's one little quirk about that, which I need to scroll up to. The answer has to be handled by the receiving intent. So the yes or no, so if I say, if I go back to Telegram and say um, yes, now I'm back into that flow. Uh, what if I, if I had said no, I would have expected it to be handled by the meme repeat uh, the, the intent that was asking it, but I actually have to handle it in the, uh, the kind of, let's say, the destination meme. So let's try that again. I will make that again. Okay, so do I want to do that again? No. Okay. But that had to be handled over here, uh, which is a little, I found a little awkward. So I, there's a, in this current intent field is, you know, the current state of the conversation and confirmation status means that I came in from one of these confirm intent actions and if it's denied that means they said something like no or nope or you know not a like it's not always a yes or no but it has to be handled in the receiver which uh, I, don't know, I found a little awkward and confusing when I first worked with it um, but anyway so that way that's complete we've we've switched the intent successfully um, and this is how you would build on to add more kind of more complex conversations. Um, let's see, I think with that, that's probably all the, all the stuff I was going to show today. Um, does anyone have any questions before I, before I finish today? Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. That's a very good question. So, right. So, say um, you know they're they've been asking for things in ways you would never have expected, right? They provide this utterances um, table, and basically anything with a status missed is something like I just didn't understand. So that's something where. Whenever it responded with sorry, I didn't understand that, that's going to land in here. And that's where you'll further fine tune the request. So you may look at the phrases that were showing up um, in this table and be like, oh, people keep saying, you know, happy birthday. I better add that to my training data. So I'll go over to whatever intent affected by it. And you can keep adding to this. So you can keep making it more refined. And if there's really like, a very specific phrase they always use, well, you should probably include that because that'll for sure match. Anything that's, anything that's actually in here is, is a definite match. Um, so yeah, that's a great question. So it's not, yeah, it's definitely not a one and done, I perfect the conversation. You would, you would pres presumably use as monitoring uh, to kind of keep refining the conversation and, and try to find out where people get into dead ends. Um, and there's a lot more, yeah, there's a lot more analytics too, just like, you know, how fast am I responding? Because that's another aspect of the conversation. I don't want to sit and wait. You know, I don't want to get uh, bogged down. So you would also want to see where your where your bottlenecks are. Thanks for a great question. So, so let's say you want to do something a bit bigger than this, and you you have a production, and you want to obviously have like pre-production, maybe unit tests, and then a separate live channel. Yep. Would that be possible? Yeah. So when you publish, so I didn't I didn't get into the publish step. That's where essentially the state of what we've just built here is is given a version and is actually is now immutable in AWS and right you can stamp these aliases on it so I could call late like right now latest is always mapped to the latest one and that's where I would create prod and assign versions to it exactly for that so you're once you're using these aliases you're you're safe to mess around with it in Lex um, yeah that's a great question one thing I don't like about the state of Lex right now is you can't really easily define all of this in um, in something like serverless or in a in an infrastructure's code approach. So you can export and import all of this, but it's still a little clunky. So there's a bit of a this is a bit error prone that it involves like manual interaction. But you're at least safe by you know having different different lifecycle aliases, and the alias plus the bot name is how you're able to actually um, send messages from Lambda to uh, into Lex. Thanks for a great question. So, oh, go ahead. Um, can you use this uh, Lex uh, AWS uh, uh, workflow also for uh, Google Help, for example? 
Yeah, well, it would. I think you have to use it. See, that that's the kind of something I want to explore. Google has its own um, bot framework dialogue flow that you'd probably use. Like, where and and Lex has. There's another form of this, which is Alexa skills, which kind of builds on this, but has different you know different functionality. Um, I don't know. I haven't tried to actually wire up Google to Lex. That seems like kind of a Frankenstein thing. But there is a similar like. All of these ideas are pretty compatible on all the other frameworks. Like the the way you would design a conversation and the pitfalls you run into are, are universal. So that, that's why I'm asking because I uh, once did something similar for dialogue flow. Mm -hmm. uh, it's almost one on one in terms of functionality and even UI of the uh, way that you create it. But uh, creating the same bot in AWS and in dialogue flow, well, as a developer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think you could um, like the cha you're not limited. It doesn't have to be. I just use Telegram, but it's not limited to just one source of messages. You could create one bot, have many channels. Um, one thing I and this was by no means an endorsement of Lex. I actually found it kind of frustrating to use versus some of the others. But if you're in AWS, the integration is I mean is the the selling point. Uh, like the UI here was pretty. Pretty tricky. There's, it's not. It's not perfect. Whereas dialogue flow, I found when I was while comparing the two, was much more seemed much more mature. Um, but yeah, I think I think uh, that would just be. I I don't know for sure, but it seems like a valid case. And it, with lambdas, you presumably could wire up everything as long as you can get events out of uh, Google Home. Then you should be able to send them to another service. Thanks. Any other questions? Well, thanks everyone. That's all. Oh, we got one more. Is there anything we're dealing with, like, internationalization? So, that's a good question, and I kind of avoided that. Lex only supports English right now, and that's what a travesty. I'm at a, I'm, I'm at a conference in Spain, and, and I'm using a bot that can only speak English. But apparently, Alexa just got multi-language support, and I, I haven't seen it announced for Lex, but I assume that would trickle down. Um, whereas dialogue flow, that's right out of the box. It's got multi-language support, so that might be better for your use case. I would definitely say if you're building a chat bot, look at all the platforms because some of them just will have better integration with, you know, if I'm building something for Slack, Lex might be a good fit, but if I'm building something for Google Messenger, you know, well then Google's probably a better fit. And they all have different levels of integration, and yeah, if I have to support multiple languages, Right now, I wouldn't I wouldn't advocate for Lex, but I don't even and until recently Alexa didn't even support multiple. So there were some kind of hacky approaches you could take, like you could run the messages through AWS Translate and feed them into English utterances. But you know I'm sure a lot would be lost in the translation. Uh, but yeah, right now no, it's just English, like me. <laughs> I think you. I haven't tried. That was one area. Yeah, I think potentially cloud formation. I saw a Terraform plugin that could do Lex, but serverless didn't support it yet. Which was so it was like you could have two different. You know, I could be using two different uh, automated configurations. Yeah, it feels like that needs that needs to be further developed because immediately I, you know, the questions of like software uh, lifecycle and stuff. I could see where. Everything else is automated. Now I have to go log into this UI to, to make a change. It's going to be error prone. So no. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thanks for being a great audience.